We're going to start a very brief series about grief today. Uh, we're calling it Through the Valley. And, uh, and the reason is, is because it seems like there's been a lot of loss recently. Uh, Reggie Dabbs with, was with us a few months ago, and he did a school assembly tour. It was fascinating to be with him in some of these schools. He would ask them, how many of you students have lost somebody that you love, a family member or a friend or somebody close to you in the last two years? He would have them raise their hand and easily 80, 90% of each of those students said that they had lost somebody. I think if we took a quick poll here today and say, you know, how many of us have lost a family member or a friend somebody that we love in the last two years. Would you mind raising your hand here? I want you to look around. That's well over 50%, if not 70, 75%. If you're watching online, perhaps you want to type the name of the person that you've lost in the last uh, two years. The Valley of the Shadow of Death has had a lot of travelers recently. Most everybody is experiencing with some type of pain and loss really the whole world. And, and not everyone is grieving well. Uh, some don't know how to grieve at all, but here's what we know. There are a lot of people that are in pain. Grief is not something that we enjoy talking about. It's, it's really kind of uncomfortable uh, talking about it. That's why this series is going to be brief. But how many know it would be wrong for us to ignore the pain that people are in? After all, we are the church. We serve a God whom the Bible says is near to the brokenhearted. So we shouldn't avoid this. We should talk about this. Is that okay? And so let's, let's begin today by talking about what, what is grief? What, what is it actually? And it's defined, grief is the response to loss. Particularly to the loss of someone or some living thing that has died to which a bond or affection was formed. Although conventionally focused on the emotional response to loss, grief also has physical, cognitive, behavioral, social, cultural, spiritual, and philosophical dimensions. While the terms are often used interchangeably, bereavement refers to the state of loss, while grief is reaction to the loss. Now, so grief is a natural human predictable, unavoidable response to loss. I heard somebody say it this way, that grief is the price of love. And that uh, the more we love somebody, the more we're going to grieve them. So grief is the evidence that you had relationships uh, that you, in, and that you've suffered a significant loss in your life. And so uh, we need to know that there will be grief because there will be loss because the Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die and then the judgment. Now, uh, I too have experienced loss, like many of you have. Uh, this past year, my mom passed away. Uh, she died alone in a nursing home. We weren't able to be with her because of COVID. The uh, funeral was limited in attendance. I know there's a lot of people that uh, had loss in 2020 that, you know, you had less than 10 people in attendance, and or the only funeral you had was a Facebook funeral, and some people had no funeral at all. There are people among us who have lost spouses. They are, some have experienced what is called out of order grief because they lost a child or a grandchild. Some have experienced a miscarriage. Some have died of COVID. Some have died due to an accident or a disease. So there's been a lot of death. And so, uh, we need to grieve. Now, I began to learn about grief in the year 1999. In January 1999, uh, our church was struck by lightning and was destroyed by fire. Now, we were a small congregation of about 100 people at this point, and that 100 people had just put so much love and time into that building, but that's how the year started. And then in March, my brother Samuel was diagnosed with cancer, and he died uh, that August. Now, I know for a lot of you that 2000, so 1999 was my year of loss. 
And I know for many of you, 2020 was your year of loss. Or 2021 is your year of loss. So earlier this week, I, I posted on social media, and I just asked, hey, if you've experienced loss, tell me about grief. Tell me about what you've learned. Tell me about what you've experienced. And really, I was asking for people to help me with this message because what I really want to do is I don't want to just tell you what I've learned about grief. I want to tell you what we've all learned about grief. So there was a huge response to that post, by the way. Well over 100 people commented on it. And, and I, one of the reasons I did it is so that we could all help each other. And if you haven't read those comments, I encourage you to take an opportunity to use that. But I'm going to use many of their comments today. And so together... I'm going to tag team with all those other people and talk about what we've learned about grief. So here's what we've learned about grief. First of all, that grief is a mystery. Grief is a mystery. Now, when you read those comments, if you choose to do that, you're going to find a common uh, thread for those who've experienced loss. Many of them say it in multiple ways that no one person's loss is exactly like another person's loss. You may have had the same type of loss, but your grief journey is different. Kila Rowe was a young married girl who lost her husband last year, tragically, and she said, grief has no time frame. It comes and goes as it pleases. Sometimes when you pray for quiet, there's still noise. You don't always understand why or how you don't get to choose. Grief is, is not a box to be checked. Okay, I grieved. Uh, there was a matter of fact, there was a famous book written years ago called uh, The Five Stages of Grief by uh, Dr. Amy Kubler-Ross. And, and you may be familiar with the five stages of grief. There is the stage of denial and anger and bargaining and depression and acceptance. Now, uh, this book and, and these ideas have been very helpful to a lot of people understanding grief and embracing grief now but there's one thing about this uh, the stages of grief is that they're not linear what that means is you probably if you've experienced the loss of a loved one uh, you're probably not going to experience these in order you may not experience all of them uh, you may experience m more than another. And, and so these are helpful to us, but the problem is in our Western culture, we tend to think of grief as steps. You know, step one, step two, step three, step four. And what we've learned is that that's not how grief works. Grief is less like a train station. Oh, we're pulling into the anger station. And then I'm pulling into the bargaining station station. No, it's, it's less like a train ride like that. It's more like a roller coaster. Some days I'm good. Some days I'm really bad. Some days I'm, I, I, I need to be around people. Some days I need to be by myself. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Our own Evelyn Garcia, her and Pastor Ed, you may know, lost a baby. And she said what they say, that it comes in waves, is true. When we had just lost Isaac, I would be okay one moment, and then it would hit me. I remember one time in particular, I was getting ready, and it just came exactly like a wave. And I understood that I needed it to happen, so I allowed the wave to take me, overwhelmed me and covered me, and I cried like a baby. So grief is messy. It's a mystery, and that's okay. The second thing that we've learned is that grief is, grief is normal. And, and what I mean by that is that it's okay to grieve. I said it's okay to grieve. Uh, it's okay to be mad, sad, angry, or afraid. It's not a lack of faith to be upset. It's not a lack of faith to cry or to have questions. It's okay to talk to God about how, well, how you're feeling. It's okay to have emotions. Uh, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be afraid uh, because God wants you to talk to him about it anyway. By the way, he already knows how you're feeling. So why not just be transparent with him? Did you know that one-third of the Psalms, there are 150 Psalms, by the way, uh, over 50 of them are Psalms about grief or complaints, uh, processing pain and injustice. 
And it's in the Bible. Sometimes you read the Psalms and you think, I can't believe that made the Bible. Well, it made the Bible because it's real. And because God is okay with us asking him questions, hard questions. There's a great book in your notes that I've noted for you. Uh, It's by Tim Keller. It's called The Songs of Jesus. It's just meditations on the Psalms. And I've heard from many people that it's very effective in helping them to grieve. We know that grief is normal because there's a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations. Now, usually when we're doing our Bible reading plan, we just read right through Lamentations because the word lament means to cry or to weep, but it's there. It's in the Bible. And of course, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 4 says, there's a time to weep. Just as normal as it is to laugh or to dance, that's how normal it is to grieve and to mourn. My friend Paul Reidenauer, somebody I went to school with years ago, uh, reached out on this post and said this. He said, I've discovered how much I don't want to give others my advice about how they should handle their grief. I've discovered that sadness is not my enemy, regardless of how spiritual people try to make me feel about it. I've discovered how annoying it is to me when people compare the death of a pet to the death of a person. I've discovered that I need to quit trying to impress others by how well I handle grief. He says, I've had a bunch of honest arguments with God, and he's okay with that. Now, grief is hard. One of the reasons it's hard is because people love us, and the people who love us, they want to comfort us, and they want to help us in our time of loss. And sometimes, out of ignorance... Can I say the vast majority of times, out of ignorance, people say things that are meant to comfort us, except it doesn't comfort us. Sometimes people say things like, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. Really? Or God has a better plan. Well, I can tell you uh, at the time when my brother passed, I didn't like that plan. Somebody said, uh, this is a test, and it'll make you stronger. I don't want to be stronger. Uh, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. How about this one? This is my least favorite one. God needed an angel. You might as well put in parentheses, because he's sadistic like that. Uh, Maybe one of the worst things that somebody could say to somebody who's grieving is, at any sentence that begins with the two words, at least. At least you still have your kids. At least you still have fill in the blank here. Any sentence that begins with the word at least, don't say it. It's not helpful. You say, Pastor, but those things are true. Yeah, they are true, but they're not very comforting. And they're not helpful in a time of loss. And a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Susan Brust uh, reached out. She said this, her and her husband lost their three-year-old son. She said, what we learned after our three-year-old son died, people mean well when giving trite answers, but only Jesus knows the pain of the grieving. Saying nothing to a grieving person only increases their pain. Sitting with the grieving is more important than one can imagine. Use their loved one's name and tell them memories you'll cherish. I mean, a lot of times we're afraid to mention the name of the person that has passed because we're afraid we'll upset them. I can tell you that the the opposite is true. You want to talk about the person who's passed because you're afraid that they'll be forgotten. She says, uh, reassure them that you'll not forget their loved one. Be careful not to overuse Romans 8, 28, which is all things work together for good. Tell them you have no idea what they're feeling because that is truthful. And look at what she says. Don't, and this is a pastor's wife, by the way. She says, don't say the Lord won't put any more on you than you can handle, because that's not true. God often allows more than we can handle, but never more than he can handle. So, okay, pastor, sounds like there's a lot of things that we shouldn't say. You're right. So let me give you some things that you can say when there's loss. Uh, somebody that you love is experiencing loss. Uh, the easiest and probably simplest is I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
Uh, another question you could ask is, is there anything I can do to help? Can I, can I get groceries? Can I bring you food? Can I mow your grass? There's typically a lot of things that need to be happening. Another thing you could say, hey, when you're ready and you need to talk, call me. I'm ready. I'm there. And obviously, a great thing to say, if you actually mean it, is I'm praying for you. If you're going to say you're praying for them, don't lie. Actually pray for them. It's powerful. See, and I think in our American culture, we, we think, I've got to say something, I've got to say something, and we've forgotten the power of presence. It's, it's, it's just being there. When, when we're around people who are grieving, we don't have to say a whole lot at all. We don't have to explain the situation. We don't have to defend God. We just need to be there. Because how many of you know, for those of you that have experienced loss, you never forget the people who showed up. You never forget. You never forget the cards that came in the mail, the phone calls you received. Those things matter more during those times than any other time. Grief is normal. And then grief is, is biblical. Grief is all throughout the Bible. Uh, there's a story in 2 Samuel chapter 3 of a mother named Rizpah who literally guarded the bodies of her sons on the battlefield, guarding them and protecting them from, from uh, vultures and buzzards. Remember King David and Bathsheba, their son died in, in uh, 2 Samuel 12. Uh, David says, someday I will go to him, but he can't come back to me. And then you've got the book of Job. Job experienced the loss of his family, his possessions, and his health in a matter of days. You've got about 38, 39 chapters of grieving and complaining and hurt and pain. It's powerful. And by the way, I read Job this last week, and I was fascinated. Job had all these uh, things to say. God never answered his questions. One of the biggest questions that we have when somebody passes is why. Can I tell you that we may never understand the why, but we can trust God. In John chapter 11, Lazarus, Jesus' friend, dies. And remember the story of Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, their first questions to Jesus, Jesus, where were you? What's going on? How did Jesus respond? The Bible says Jesus wept. Sometimes I think we memorize that because it's the shortest verse in the Bible. But when you dig deep into that verse, you realize Jesus didn't just let a Denzel Washington tear trickle down his face. No, this was a deep grief that he expressed. Did you know Jesus grieved? Not just here in John chapter 11, but also in Matthew chapter 14, verse 6. The Bible says that the king had John, John the Baptist, beheaded in the prison. And so John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And so then they went and told Jesus that John was dead. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Why? He was taking time to grieve. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now think about this, John was Jesus' cousin, so he's a family member, but there was no other human on earth that understood Jesus more than John. Because both of their births were miraculous, and the Bible calls John the Baptist the forerunner of Jesus. John was preparing the way for Jesus. John and Jesus were tied at the hip prophetically, and Jesus gets word, hey, this guy who is very close to you, he died. Can I tell you that Jesus felt this loss very, very deeply, so much so that he withdrew away from the crowd by himself. Why? To take time to grieve. And this is a great reminder for all of us that we're tempted, again, as Americans in our Western culture, just go, just keep going, going, going. No, you got to take time to grieve. And of course, Jesus was fully God and he was fully man. So, why would Jesus need to grieve? Well, the Bible says that he was a man. He was just like us. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, talking about Jesus, this high priest of ours understands. 
If you're hurting today, if you're feeling lost today, if you're grieving today, I've got some really good news. Jesus understands. He does. He experienced the exact same thing. And so did his father. He loves us. Grief is, is needed. Grief is necessary. We're wired to grieve. God created it this way. Um, if Jesus took time to grieve, how many know we should take time to grieve as well? Experts tell us that it uh, can take 18 to 24 months before someone starts to heal. And again, we think, well, move on, move on. You just got to move on. Please don't ever say, move on. We got to recognize that it takes time for people to heal. And it can take a lot longer if you ignore the grief or if you try to escape the grief or escape the pain. It's, it's natural for us as humans. We want to avoid pain at all costs. We want to suppress the hurt. And, and so instead of embracing the pain of grief, we choose to be numb. And we anesthetize ourselves. Now, the problem is that if you are choosing to be numb, well, not only are you not feeling the pain, but you're also not feeling the encouragement. You're not feeling the love. You're not feeling the comfort that God wants you to have. Because if, if you're suppressing the negative feelings, that means you're also suppressing the good ones as well. Does that make sense? Again, we often choose to escape grief rather than to find comfort in our grief. Proverbs says, when the laughter ends, the grief remains. So we look for ways to escape our pain. Laughter is one way that we choose to do that. You could say when the shopping ends, the grief remains. When the Netflix binge watching ends, the grief remains. When someone we love dies, how many know there's immediately this checklist that begins to happen, especially if it's your spouse uh, that passes away. You've got these things you've got to do, you've got to get done. It begins with the details of the funeral. Right? You've got to work all of that out and, uh, and the details of the service. And many times that's like a whirlwind. And then you've got to deal with a cemetery and a plot and a headstone. And then you have the service. And then you go to the cemetery. And then you bury them. And then you go back 30 to 60 days. And you've got to set the headstone. And now you've got to call Social Security. And you've got to deal with life insurance and any uh, issues about that. And you think, you know, as soon as I get through the list, the checklist, my life will be better. Uh, okay, I'm going to call Salvation Army, and they're going to come and get these clothes and get this stuff, and I'm going to get all this emptied out, and, and I'm going to sell the car. I got the car sold, and finally we get to the end of the list. We got it all done, and we think, okay, now I can be better. And the problem is that's usually when it gets worse, when it gets really hard, because that's usually when the cards stop and the phone calls cease. And all this time you've been doing your list, grief is over in the corner doing push-ups saying, you ready now? We need to deal with this. Are you ready? And often that's when people get a tsunami of emotions that just wave, just overshadow so many people. It could be a song. It could be a fragrance. It could be a, an aroma that reminds you of that person and just triggers this wave of emotion. And it comes from nowhere. Uh, somebody goes by you. They walk by you, and they're about the same height and build and hair color of the person that you love. And for a brief moment, you think that. And then you realize they're gone. And here comes the emotion again and again. So many people on social media describe grief like a fog. You go, sometimes it's so thick you can barely see in front of your face, and sometimes it's just a low-lying mist. Joel put it this way. He says, it's a fog. I always wondered how people survive losing someone very close. You're not right. Thoughts are large and slow. Everything is a haze, like a nightmare too foggy to actually see it. It's hard to explain like someone said above. You don't forget or move on. It's just the new normal. And further you get away from that day, it doesn't get easier. You just get breaks between getting hit by that train. It's tough. 
I appreciate that honesty. See, we need to grieve. We need to embrace the pain of grief. Instead of running from it, instead of trying to escape it, instead of trying to run away from grief, let's run to comfort. And by the way, comfort is running to someone. His name is Jesus. Can I tell you that one of the best ways to embrace the hurt, embrace the pain of grief is by sharing your story with somebody else. I've got some good news. Uh, we are starting two small groups today, as a matter of fact, uh, for people who are experiencing grief. The first one begins today at 11 o'clock in room 103. Literally after this service is over, you say, I, I just need to, I, I need to do this. I need to talk to somebody. I need to be part of a group. Uh, Pastor Gary Brack is going to be leading this group, again, beginning today, right at this service. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to press go. You don't have to pay anything. Just show up right there. If you have any deep questions about that, they'll be at the red information tent, and you can, you can do that. Just do it. Maybe you need to text somebody who knows who's grieving. Hey, I want you to join me for this class. It'll help you. The second class is going to happen every, two, uh, every Sunday at 2 p.m. in room 105. Don Sanders is leading this particular group, and uh, that's meeting in the afternoon, 105. If that time works better for you, then do that. And again, you may know somebody that you need to go through this class with or somebody, hey, I'll go with you. Maybe before this service is over, you can text them or invite them, say, hey, let's go together. Because grief is normal, and grief is needed. We need to grieve well. And here's the last one. Grief can be a gift. Now, when I say grief can be a gift, please hear me what I am not saying. I am not saying that losing your loved one is a gift. I'm not saying that my brother dying at 36 years old was a gift. I'm not saying that my mom passing away during COVID was a gift. I'm not saying that that person that you hurt so much because you miss them is a gift. What I am saying is that we can choose to respond to loss in such a way that can make us stronger and different in a better way. Let's look to Jesus. Remember, he had just gotten news about John the Baptist, his cousin, his friend who had died. And the Bible says, hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. The result of the death of John the Baptist was Jesus had compassion. But Pastor White, Jesus was God. Certainly God is already compassionate. Yeah, but his human side that he chose to live in had a new awareness of the need for compassion. See, there's something about experiencing loss yourself that makes you much more compassionate to people who are hurting. All of a sudden, your eyes get open to a world around you that people are hurting and people are broken. I remember after my brother passed, it was a, just, a, I think it was a few weeks, uh, I'm driving down the road, I'm listening to this talk radio show, I think it was about, I think it was Dave Ramsey or something like that, and, and I'm just passing the time as I'm driving. This lady calls in to the show and she's crying because she has to deal with the loss of her husband who had died of cancer. The year before, I probably would have heard like that. I heard a story like that and said, well, you know, that's too bad. But I started crying so hard. I had to pull over to the side of the road. and said, people everywhere are hurting. I didn't know. And there was this compassion that I now had that I didn't have before. And it made me, it made me different. You know, in the first few months and years after I experienced loss, I learned more about myself and about God than I knew before I experienced loss. Matter of fact, there's a, there's a verse in Psalm 119, I was reading a few months later. Remember I told you 1999, it was a year of loss all around. And then I read this verse. It is good for me that I've been afflicted. 
I just remember reading that verse like, I have never seen that before. It's good for me to be afflicted? Are you kidding me? But look at it, it says, that I might learn your statutes. There is a depth to you. There is a compassion that we can develop. There is a faith that we can have. Please hear me when I say, there is a new level to your faith after you experience loss than you had before. Are you with me? I was reading James chapter 1 a few months after the fire. The Bible says, count it all joy when you walk through various trials. That verse meant something different to me now. And this one did too. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the contrite in spirit. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. You see, in our grief, God is revealed to us in a much deeper way. I know God better now. I know his heart better because of loss. And now, when I think about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, again, before loss, I might have said, oh, that's good. I believed that my whole life. But now I understand it a little better. Jesus died for my sin? He did what? He was in the ground, in that cold ground, six feet on. What? And all of a sudden, the price that was paid for me, for you, it becomes a lot more powerful. God chose that. I don't know about you, but I would choose to never experience that. God says, I'm going to choose that. Why? For you. We know it in our head, but grief can be a gift because now we know it in our hearts. It's no longer me saying, hey, trust God, trust God. I'm saying from the depth of my soul, he loves you. From the depths of my heart. He loves you. He is near to the brokenhearted. And if you open up your life to him and you'll open up your heart to him, he'll put his arms around you. He'll help you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Let me show you one more verse, and then we're going to pray. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You're with me. In Christmas, we talk about it. His name is Emmanuel. God is with us. He's not just with us at Christmas. He's with us in the valley even the valley of the shadow of death. And I don't have to stop in the valley. I don't have to live in the valley. He is walking with me through the valley because on the other end of that valley, there's hope, there's peace, there's joy, there's life, there is new life, there is a new normal, there is God doing wonderful and powerful things through you and in you and in the lives of those people around you. He loves you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're watching online, would you take a moment and just bow your head and close your eyes? There were so many hands of people that were raised that said, I've experienced loss in the last two years. If that's you, would you take your two hands and just extend them to the Lord with your palms up if you would? right out in front of you. Just take your two hands. You say, Lord, I give you my grief. I give you my pain. I give you my hurt. 
if I give you my loss. God, I miss him so much. The holidays are coming. It's going to be harder. Would you be with me more than I've ever known? You're the God of all comfort. Comfort me, Jesus. Would you take my hands? Lead me through this time, God. I trust you. I believe you. I don't always feel like it, God, but I know you're real. I don't understand, but I'm choosing to trust you right now. I don't know why. I don't know why this happened, God. But the old song says we'll understand it better by and by. And so, God, I'm going to trust you because you understand. Jesus, would you heal my friends? Jesus, would you put your arms around them? Would you encourage them and strengthen them, God? Would you heal their hearts and their hurt? Would you take away the spirit of heaviness, God, and give them hope? God, for those who are trying to escape the pain, I pray, Lord, that they would run to comfort instead of escape. Heal their hearts, God. Would you stand with me today? so many hands that were raised earlier and those of you who were watching online typed many names I prayed about how to end this service and I really don't know any other way except to ask if you want to please I understand if you don't want to I'm not trying to press you I'm not saying if you love Jesus you've got to do XYZ I am saying if you want to in a moment you raised your hand, you've experienced loss. I'm gonna ask you to come to the front with many other people who have also experienced loss. And I just wanna pray for you. I wanna pray with you. And I know with COVID and all these things, you pastor, that's the last place that I wanna be because people are gonna start hugging me. And I, I get it, I get it. If you don't want to, no pressure. Some of you want to, and some of you need to. Because you're in the valley. And we want you to know you're not alone. The Lord is with you. So as we sing this song, say, Pastor, that's me. Would you make your way to the front right now? Make your way to the front. If you're watching online, just type the names of the people that you've lost. Pastor, I've experienced loss in the last two years. I want God to heal my heart. I want you to come as Steve said. Any, again, anybody that's willing, you've experienced loss too, and you've been through the valley. If you'd like to come and pray for any of these people here today, maybe just want to put an arm around them, encourage them, pray for them. You've been where they've been. You've hurt like they're hurting. If that's you, I want you to come now, and we're just going to begin to pray for them, okay? If you need to go, I completely understand. I'm going to ask you to leave reverently and quietly. But we're just going to take some time and let these men and women and these students just be wrapped in the arms of God. Is that okay today?
But if you'd like to come and pray for these, I'd so much appreciate it if you would and encourage them today. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ.